Welcome to History at the OK Corral. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, and share this episode with a fellow history lover. And now, on to tonight's episode. May 18th, 1754. Colonel George Washington stands at the bottom of a rocky gulch after a brief yet grisly shootout amongst an encampment of French-Canadian troops and Washington's 40 Virginia militiamen joined by a dozen Iroquois warriors. The clash would end as a resounding victory for young George Washington, with over a dozen killed for the French and the rest surrendering. After the final shots had rang out in the early morning hours of the battle, Tanisherishan, known as the Half-King, a Mingo chief, had viciously killed the French officer Joseph Couillon. However, this victory would come at a heavy price in the not-so-distant future. Washington's men fell back to the Great Meadows, a broad open field enclosed by a distant tree line the colonel had used to make camp before the Battle of Humanville. Colonel Washington, aware of a pending reprisal by the French, instructed his men to drive their spades into the earth and begin construction, with what little resources they had available of a defensive outpost that Washington dubbed Fort Necessity. Washington had been charged with leading this Virginia militia group to stave off encroachment of the Ohio country by New France. Though just 22 years of age, the hand of fate had a way of exalting the young Virginian into remarkable circumstance. On May 31st, Colonel Joshua Fry, commander-in-chief of colonial forces, fell from his horse and died, putting George Washington in full command of the Virginia troops. The next day, the 1st of June, Governor Dinwiddie sent a letter to Washington stating the encounter at Humanville was a resounding success, dispelling any concerns Washington may have had that his actions would be looked upon negatively. Dinwiddie would write, I heartily congratulate you, as it may give testimony to the Indians that the French are not invincible when fairly engaged with the English. Dinwiddie would address his superiors abroad with a different tone, stating that Washington's forces had been merely auxiliary to the half-king and that the natives were the aggressors in the skirmish, given that the colonials were purely on a defensive assignment. 200 more Virginia militiamen arrived the first week of June, soon followed by an independent company from South Carolina bringing 100 British regulars and 40 beef cattle to feed the men. While those in France looked upon Washington as an assassin, higher-ups in London used this opportunity to label him and his fellow provincial officers as untrustworthy, and Washington's desire to be regarded with the same esteem of the British royal officers suffered a blow because of his actions. Captain McKay arrived with 100 men on June 14th, and he made clear to Washington that he was not beholden to any orders given to him by the colonial officer. McKay and his men camped outside the walls of the fort in the Green Meadows. Washington had been promised 50,000 pounds of flour by the middle of June, but the provisions would never arrive, straining the resources of a regiment of several hundred men. Washington set out towards Fort Redstone, the location of Christopher Gist, struggling mightily on the trek as they lost numerous horses and were repeatedly hamstrung by broken-down wagons along the way. While at Fort Redstone, Washington and Tenesherishan met with Delaware, Shawnee, and Mingo representatives, all of whom declined to further involve themselves with the British in this dispute. The half-king felt the shift in tone went beyond neutrality and that the other tribes may be prepared to fight alongside the French. The Ohio natives were disinterested in shedding blood on behalf of the British to expel the French, only to be put out further by colonial expansion into their territory. Washington would reveal his thoughts on the natives in his journal after this diplomatic summit. Treacherous devils, who were sent by the French as spies, who would turn against us at any time. The half-king likewise stated that Washington took it upon himself to command the Indians as slaves, and refused to take advice from the Indians. The natives also believed that Fort Necessity was a poorly located, designed, and fortified structure, with Tanish Arishan referring to it as that little thing upon the meadow. On June 28th, Washington orders his men inside the makeshift circular fort after receiving reports that a force of 800 French, along with 400 natives, were slated to attack their position. While the numbers were inflated slightly, this represented a contingent with seven times the manpower available to Washington. The man leading the French troops held a strong personal interest in the matter, Louis Couillon de Villiers, the elder brother of the slain Joseph Couillon de Humanville. He had begged his superiors for the chance at retribution against Washington's men. While the haphazardly constructed fort itself 
created vulnerabilities for Washington and his men, they had also gone without bread or meat for a week's time now, and had since subsisted on meager rations of spoiling corn. The small confines of the fort, just 50 feet in diameter, and only capable of housing 50 to 60 men, required trenches to be dug out of the walls to provide additional cover for the reinforcements that had arrived with Colonel McKay, thus creating a series of breastworks on all sides of the structure. With nine small cannons inside the fort to act as the primary defense and deterrence, the fort was surrounded by trees and elevated terrain just a few dozen yards away from its walls. The wooded landscape gave greater cover to an attacking force as well as seeding them the high ground. These far less than ideal conditions to place a fort would be steadfastly defended by Washington for the rest of his life, having viewed the area as more of a camp and staging area for an offensive campaign than an impenetrable fortress. The young colonel was nevertheless about to learn a devastating lesson in battlefield strategy, whether he would admit it or not. On July 3, 1754, word came to Washington that a sizable force of French-Canadian militiamen were sighted less than four miles from Fort Necessity. While Colonel Washington was unaware of it at the time, the French troops had trekked through Remonville Glen on their way towards Fort Necessity and stumbled upon the unburied, scalped, and decaying bodies of their fellow countrymen. This would inflame their bloodlust to a fever pitch. Just before 11 a.m., this hostile ensemble of French and Indian warriors came down upon Fort Necessity, marching forward in three columns. Their shouts and battle cries filled the air before being drowned out by musket and cannon fire from the British allied men who scattered the columns apart as they frantically fell back into the woods. Washington had anticipated engaging in a more traditional form of combat, one viewed as dignified at the time, of well-uniformed men standing toe-to-toe -to -toe in a field, firing upon one another in turns. But he would today receive a lesson in a style of guerrilla warfare that would shape his combat knowledge. He would call it Indian fighting, with the emphasis on surprise, cunning, and merciless ambush, to inflict abrupt damage often followed by a retreat before a counterattack could be waged. He would carry this calamitous lesson with him throughout his time as the first commander-in-chief of the U.S. Army during the Revolutionary War, exploiting the soft underbelly of his opponents wherever it presented itself. The French and Indian detachment kept a constant fire upon the composite force of British and colonial men. From every tree, stone, and stump, Coulion's forces nailed precision shots from behind cover and inflicted heavy casualties while taking almost none themselves. After several hours of this onslaught, the sky let loose a torrential rain, turning Fort Necessity into a soupy mire, filling trenches with cumbersome mud, and with no roof or covering of any kind on the fortification, the armory within it was drenched by the downpour, and became increasingly unreliable until the colonial Britons lost the capacity to even return fire as dark fell upon the great meadows. Looking upon this scene from overhead made for a truly pitiful sight, with over 100 colonial British casualties nearly a third of all Washington's men, bodies strewn amongst crimson puddles of earth and sludge, dead or mercilessly dying, death showing its prejudice to neither animal nor man, having taken the lives of all the livestock and dogs in the vicinity as well. The Franco-Indian force more than just dominated the battle, their actions were akin to wholesale slaughter, leaving a scene of chaotic destruction while suffering only three killed of their roughly 1,200 men compound the embarrassment for Washington, the Virginia militiamen broke into the fort's liquor supply, becoming stone drunk, wilting under the hopelessness of their circumstance. On the contrary, His Majesty's regular troops stood tall in the face of this adversity, showing a marked difference in professionalism and ability between the veteran force of the British troops and the ragtag band of transients that made up the bulk of the colonial militia. Washington would furthermore go on to detest the mixing of his troops and alcohol after this intoxicated display, just as it seemed the French-Indian coalition could at any moment descend from the trees and kill them to the last man, a French officer came out of the woods, anxiously walking toward the fort, waving a white flag, offering to discuss the terms of a potential surrender of the colonial British. Washington and McKay selected their French interpreter, Jacob von Braum, to parlay terms of their surrender, among them that the men would be released to return back to the colonies should they agree to not return to the forks of the Ohio for a minimum of one year. But even more geopolitically important was that Washington 
was sign a document, albeit one that was poorly translated to him by von Braum that stated that the attack on Fort Necessity was in retaliation for the, quote, assassination of Humanville. This key phrasing, assassination, was included in the surrender unbeknownst to Washington and McKay, as they signed off on the agreed-upon terms, hearing instead from von Braum that it had been, quote, death or loss, or a more neutral characterization of the slaying of Humanville. Washington's inadvertent admission would be used as a key component of propaganda throughout France and all the territories she held, labeling Washington as a nefarious, antagonistic killer, and giving the French Empire the public support needed to mobilize against British colonial encroachment in North America. To further hasten the shame he faced, Washington's personal journal was commandeered and would be mass-printed and distributed widely through France. Upon reading this journal, Governor Duquesne, the French administrator of New France, would laugh and openly mock what he thought of as the feeble-minded Virginian. In spite of all this, Washington displayed an unflappable resolve during the firefight, never flinching as the bullets whistled by his head and the bodies of his militiamen continued to pile up around him. He kept his focus on the moment, giving and carrying out orders as the ever more dire situation called for. This loss would be a bitter pill to swallow, but one that would serve as crucial in shaping him into a formidable general in time. The strength of the forces presented in the Ohio country, so vastly in favor of the French, were not reflective of the composition of North America. The whole of New France had a mere 75,000 inhabitants, while the British colonies were home to a population of 1.1 million, as well as 300,000 black slaves. Governor Dinwiddie would use the events of Fort Necessity as a call to arms for his fellow royal governors throughout the colonies, but would stir up little interest from them and their abundant populace. The reports on the battle Dinwiddie sent to London would be received far differently. King George II viewed the Ohio country as the keystone to westward colonial expansion beyond the Appalachian Mountains. He would commission Major General Braddock to sail to the shores of Virginia with two regiments the following year to unite with the colonial forces and wage a campaign of aggression on multiple fronts to ruthlessly drive out the French incursion. But for tonight, those are other stories for other times. Thank you for joining us on this episode of History at the OK Corral. Be sure to click the like button, share this episode with a friend, and become a subscriber. Also, if you'd like to support our work and gain early access to episodes, as well as ad-free viewing, you can become a member of this channel by clicking the join button, or click the link in the description below to become a member on Patreon. Thank you again for watching, and we'll see you next time on History at the OK Corral, home of history's greatest shootouts and showdowns.